So welcome everyone to the um, Let's Talk Business Models about plastics recycling. Um, I'm very excited for today's episode. This is a topic that I've been personally extremely interested in for, for years now. Um, it's a huge need all around the world um, to make good use of plastic waste. Um, and there are so many products that, are, that we use all over the place that are made of plastic. Um, the challenge is to get the uh, processing equipment that works well at a small scale and the business models that work well for small scale entrepreneurs. So we're going to be discussing some of the um, some of the advantages and challenges of that today. Um, the speakers we have are Wajim Yakubunuhu from Ifrik Eco Solutions in Nigeria and Surin Lex um, from Plasticpreneur in Austria. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to just introduce yourselves and your organisation, just giving us a bit of an overview of uh, how you got started and what it is you do, please. So, Wajim, if I could start with you, please. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of this programme. So, uh, my name is Wajim Yakubu Nuhu, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of IFRIC Eco Solutions. So Ifric Eco Solutions is a startup uh, in Nigeria. Uh, we were established in 2017 and uh, we are a purpose-driven enterprise that uh, uh, recycles plastic wastes. Uh, we also do other things like using plastic to construct uh, eco toilets, using uh, plastic to construct bricks, using plastic to construct interlocking pavers, and also, uh, we've tried out how to use plastic to uh, to produce uh, uh, basically petrol, oil, and diesel. So uh, that's the brief introduction for now, and uh, I will talk more as time goes on. Thank you. Thanks Hello, my very name. much. Hi, my name, is, hi, my name is Seren. I'm based in Austria, as Anna mentioned. Um, it all started a couple of years ago um, when we were in Eastern Africa, especially in Uganda, working on business models um, for rural areas and thought that there's enough plastic waste and enough opportunities to turn this into new products and then realized that there are no real tools or equipment to do so. So then we started a journey of developing uh, and now producing small scale plastic recycling machines, which hundreds of them are in use in more than 85 countries by now. Um, and excited to discuss today and see where this conversation leads us. Thank you so much. Um, Wajim um, has had a few network connection issues. So um, I said it's not an issue if he turns his camera off. Um, so he may do that, um, but hopefully you can still hear us okay. Um, Wajim, I wonder if you could just uh, tell us a bit about the customers that you serve. So who is it that, um, that is interested in buying the recycled plastic products where you are? And if I could just ask you to unmute, uh, I think I can. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. All right, great. So uh, there are lots of customers uh, across the plastic uh, value chain and supply chain here in Nigeria. So it's quite uh, it's an industry. You know, there's some form of um, uh, market for it's still young, but then, uh, even at that, there's still quite a market for the plastic industry, plastic recycling industry generally in Nigeria. There are so much, there are so many young entrepreneurs that are now beginning to value plastic waste. And uh, the industry is, is really, really growing in large strides. And of recent, we're even having um, people, foreigners coming to Nigeria to partake in the whole plastic waste industry. So we have the Chinese now coming into Nigeria. Uh, it's quite of um, best, it's, it's quite of an advantage and a disadvantage. Advantage because it tries the, the upcoming entrepreneurs out. But then the advantage is that there's a huge market for plastic waste in Nigeria and Africa generally. So for our own product, uh, which is recycled plastic into interlocking tiles, 
the market is quite huge to be honest. And um, we had a contact with Nigeria, outside Nigeria, for people that are interested in our products. Uh, so we have people that are building houses, people that are into real estate. Uh, they are very much interested in our products since we produce interlocking pavers. But uh, one of the challenges we have is to meet the demand uh, because we we don't have the capacity. I think uh, as time goes on, I'll explain better. But for now, uh, those are the the, the, the the markets we have here in Nigeria for our products. Thank you. Thank you. And Søren, of course, you have a different model. You're making selling the equipment to other um, producers of, of plastic products um, but could you just talk a little bit about the different types of customers that you have please yes it's a very hard question because like i mentioned in the statement in the beginning first we developed and designed everything we do for infrastructural regions which are maybe far abroad um, so designed them to really work in refugee camps and and settings where there's limited access to electricity and and other things um, nowadays, most of our customers are in Europe. Um, big brands like Nike, Adidas, Volkswagen, BMW, and so on and so forth are using them in R&D purposes, in educational purposes, in technical education, in workshops. Um, on the other side, we do have similar organizations like uh, Vachim, Vachim works for, um, producing uh, pavement tiles and things in Nigeria, Ghana, Uganda, Kenya, and so on and so forth. So we have from really producing companies up to awareness raising, educational aspects, prototyping, and everything in between. And I know from when we've talked before, sir, and that you have um, that you've sold a number of of your machines to maker spaces. I just wonder if you could say a little bit more if you know about what they use them for, um, whether that's educational or, or business purposes or what. Yes, we have sold them to a lot of makerspaces um, and, and fab labs. And also there it's different use cases. So we all know, of course, the 3D printing part, which is, of course, uh, a heart of every makerspace, I guess, today. Um, and then there's the next step. So once some, some, somebody came up with an idea and 3D printed maybe the idea, but now once a couple of hundreds of units of it, then the injection molding would be the next step. So it fits perfectly with the 3D printing idea. Um, so in a makerspace, they're used just as equipment people can access. And then, of course, the makerspace makes money because they're renting the equipment to the, the users, at least as the model we have here, often in our regions. Um, on the other side, we do have makerspaces who are hosting, for instance, Austrian Slarger's makerspace now. Um, they are opening up and school classes are coming and using them. Um, so it's the educational aspect. Um, and then we do have makerspaces who are really producing. So a company orders a couple of hundreds of units of a, a product, a recycled product. So then the makerspace is also producing them. So again, it's from educational R&D up to producing um, the whole spectrum. Great, thank you. Um, Wajim, if I could turn back to you now, please. And I've got um, a question has been put in the chat from Felix Holm. Um, I'll, I'll read it out, but Felix, if there's anything you want to add, feel free to unmute and um, and ask yourself. Um, so it says, what are the products, Nigeria, more details and the clients for the products? Okay, so for now, we, we have one major product that we've gone commercial with, and that is the interlocking papers. So basically, um, we produce interlocking papers from plastic waste. But beyond that, we, we are trying to bring in new products into the market. We've, uh, we've highlighted, we've designed, highlighted and produced in bricks. So uh, bricks, they are like a dry stack technology. So basically, you use them to build, but you don't use mortar. So after you have your foundation, you, you use the, the plastic bricks to build. And it's very, very good because it saves cost. It will save you close to 30% or more of the building cost since you don't need mortar to bind it together. So you reduce on the cost of cement. It's more environmentally friendly. So we are still very much in the pilot stage with that. We haven't gone commercial with that yet. And also uh, the plastic to, to energy in terms of um, 
uh, converting plastic to diesel electricity, uh, diesel, uh, kerosene, and petrol. We, we've just trialed it. We haven't gone commercial yet. So one of the things we do in our company is to also carry out research. So there's so much potential for that. And also bricks. Now we focus on the interest. Like I said, most of our customers are, are, are real estate people into real estate people that are building uh, individuals, companies, and all of that. So those are basically the products we produce for now, and then those are our clientele for now. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and I know that uh, in his introduction, Søren had mentioned the challenge of, um, of equipment. And so I wanted to ask you what kind of equipment you use and whether you've developed it yourself or, or bought it and any challenges in that area. For now, because we're very much in a startup, we're very much in our startup, so we have issues with access to funds to to acquire the equipment we really, really need. So for now, unfortunately, we still produce it manually. We burn, we, we, we melt the plastic over open fires. Unfortunately, it's not very environmentally friendly. And then there are also bit of health hazards to that. But unfortunately, that is what we can afford to do right now. So our intention was to come up with a minimum viable product. And then as time goes on, we get funding and then we scale from there. So we design our own machines and then we fabricate them locally because it's cheaper for us due to exchange rate issues to do that than to buy from abroad. But having said that, we are very much open to having uh, some of the products he produces. So basically, we have uh, three three main equipments that we use. So there's what we call the shredder or the crusher. So that crushes the plastic into smaller pieces. Then uh, there's also another equipment we need called an extruder. So what an extruder does or a densifier is that it melts the plastic into um, uh, a mass, a semi-liquid mass, which we mix in our sand and then pour it into a mold. So for now, we can't afford to use the ones he sells. So we have to make do with what we have, which is the manual open fire process, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, Saran, if I could come to you for some thoughts on uh, on equipment and processes, please. Yeah, I mean, like Martin mentioned, that's, of course, a way how to process plastic, which is done in many, many places. It's a very, very easy and simple and cheap way, not a very healthy way, not for the people working and not for the environment, of course. Um, but that opens exactly the question we raised a couple of years ago. So why is this the only way how it can be done? Um, and of course, we also face a lot of challenges developing machines and products and as, as Vachi mentioned of course they are they cost something and and it's not that then everybody can do it on the other side we also looked a lot into producing them locally and we had lots of projects in especially eastern africa where we tried similar things like like Vachi mentioned and then realized that it's on the on the monetary side it costs more at the end because we more spare parts things are breaking often much more down um and then we we went away from this thought and said, okay, we are producing them in a high quality with good materials in Austria and then ship it. So in overall, the environmental footprint and everything might be equal or less than than having constantly the, the issues of replacing things locally or then standing still everything. Um, we know partners in, in some countries were finding an extruder screw in a scrapyard and build a whole machine and the whole business model around this one extruder screw they're finding. And once this breaks down, they cannot replace it. So then the whole business suddenly shuts down with people who are, of course, depending on the business working. Um, so we really try to, to have all of this put together that it's in a way that it works for the people. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, the question then becomes, how can we find ways to get the equipment into the hands of more people who would use it? Um, I mean, and and Wajim talked about the, the challenges of not having enough capacity, um, you know, knowing that the, the processing methods aren't ideal, but 
um, not currently having access to better ones. Um, and I well, guess this is an open question to everyone, but you know, what, what solutions are there for, for getting this, this kind of equipment into the hands of more people? Maybe I can jump in because that's, uh, I don't think it's a technical question. So no. most people in research programs and, and startups like watching their focus on the technical side and say, well, if we could know how to mix the sand and the plastic and everything, we could do it. But it's rather, in our opinion, it's rather a market side. Once we know mm -hmm. that we have sold 5,000 pavement tiles, it's just a calculation of how to afford the machines or how to get the machines there. And then I need to find the right partner, the right supplier of these equipment. Um, and because these things are new on the markets, the plastic products are new in the markets, um, people don't really know how, yeah, what to, to think of them or how they can integrate or be integrated in the in the local products they can they can source. Um, so on the one side, we are working on funds so that people can pre-finance everything um, once the business model is working. Um, on the other side, we always say, don't worry about buying machines, worry about making larger contracts with customers like fence poles, sell 1,000 fence poles or not 5 fence poles. And once you have the signed contract with like a governmental entity or like a, a, a school or whatever, um, then the technical side is quite easy and simple. Um, so I think that's and also the topic of the day is like the business models. I think that's much more the topic to talk about than the technical side, how to do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Can, Can I come in? on that, Rajim? Yeah, yeah, please, I do. So um, like he rightly said, um, the problem is not a technical problem. I think it's basically a way of finding a middle ground that will be win-win for the producers, the OEMs, and then people like us that uh, uh, use these entrepreneurs. There's a lot of interest and there are lots of uh, young entrepreneurs that want to go into what we're doing. But unfortunately, uh, the thing with the kind of business we're doing is that it's, it's a little bit expensive to start. So uh, there's a need to have uh, some kind of way whereby we can have support. And uh, there is support in some way, but it's just that it's not enough for everybody. So I belong to an association called Recyclers Association of Nigeria. And there was a way we did the organization interface with like Coca-Cola. And I think they got about a million dollars from Coca-Cola, which they used to buy some equipment for some members. Well, unfortunately, very, very few members would uh, benefit and stuff like that. So I think one way of solving that will be to interface with uh, large multi multinationals like Pepsi, Nestle, Coca-Cola that uh, actually generate a lot of plastic. And so they will be able to purchase these things from people like Sorin and then uh, give it to people like us that are in need. That's one way to go about it. Another way could be if we could have some kind of funds uh, because in Africa, there's a challenge of, we have governance issues. I'm not going to lie about that. So unlike in some other places whereby uh, it's, it's easier to access banks, to get loans and stuff like that. It, it's not really like that in Africa. We have issues around that. So we need alternatives. So one way, like I said, besides the multinational uh, companies is if we have a kind of fund whereby um, uh, entrepreneurs like us can access, then we can now buy uh, this machinery from Soren and then uh, use them and then maybe pay it back as a loan. Another thing could be also to get grants. So uh, that those are some of the ways I feel we could uh, solve this problem. Yeah, yeah, some, um, some great ideas there. Um, Soren, you, you mentioned that some of these sort of larger corporate organizations are um, using your equipment for R and D. Um, have you have you seen any interest from them in sort of large or well, significant scale CSR efforts to deal with the plastic waste that some of them are causing? Or is that not conversations that are being had right now? No, it is, but it takes years or months. Um, and we only exist for three years. So we have these conversations and we're talking about large numbers and large projects. And we have 
pilots in these cases uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think a, a large a, a large topic here is that there are so many pro uh, so many projects around plastic waste, reducing plastic waste, and so many platforms and so many initiatives and so on. And everybody, of course, wants to be part in in it and be part of something. And everybody's sort of doing the same, um, but not combined. There's not this one global thing. Well, there are, of course, these global initiatives and so on. But it's sort of so much so scattered because there's so many people and organizations working on it. And I think it's really hard to combine and say, okay, this works in this country and now let's scale it in the same country big time. And so rather everybody, the same with us, we come up and say, well, we have a new idea, we have a new approach. And again, we are also one of many, many who have ideas and solutions. Um, and we believe it's a good one and everybody else believes they have good ones and they are all good. So I think that's one of the main challenges that it's a topic where so many people scream around um, and only few really know um, how to work with it on the technical side. Um, we have we have very we are working very closely with a company called Arema Group. They are the industrial number one um, on recycling equipment. So they do something what we are doing like a thousand times bigger. Um, and they say, well, all the things we are discussing, it, they're already so solved, just not on this small scale level and the business models around. Um, but there's no interaction between these initiatives and then these organizations like Vachim with these large industrial companies who know everything about plastic, you know everything about recycling, know everything about producing. But we all try to reinvent the wheel, basically. Yeah, yeah, I I see that, but I also think that the large companies uh, are not always very interested in figuring out how to make it work on a small scale, um, and that, that you know is something that that needs dedicated attention. Um, well, and maybe maybe to add on this, this this one company, uh, which is now shareholder actually in our business, they said before they made us, they never thought about small scale plastic recycling. So they're number one in the world for thirty years in business, and until five years ago, they didn't think about the small initiatives and that in decentralized recycling is possible because that doesn't exist in the plastic industry. It's all large scale hundreds of thousands of units, big cities, but that there's plastic waste all over the world and needs to be decentralized recycled because transportation costs and everything just isn't worth it. That's something, it's like a blind spot nobody really sees. Well, that's fantastic that some people at least are recognizing it, um, that, that has been spotted. Um, uh, Andrew, I can see you've got your hand up, but I think Felix ha asked some questions in the chat that came first. So I'm just going to ask Felix, would you like to, to ask your questions? Okay, just, maybe Felix isn't able to unmute at the moment. So Andrew, go ahead and I'll, um, I'll pick up Felix's questions in a moment. Thanks, and uh, thank you for the, for the webinar today. Um, I, I, picking up on that point, uh, I've experienced similar things that actually the mainstream um, recycling sector doesn't see um, a need for investment in small scale um, plastic recycling machines. And sometimes that's because um, you know, the, there isn't the, you know, the places where the market is developed, there isn't that kind of demand. You know, in, it, typically, my experience is a lot of manufacturing is designed around large scale facilities, uh, wealthy places that have the, uh, the ability to raise large capital investments, blah, blah, blah. Um, certainly in the South Pacific or in um, you know, refugee camp, you don't need large scale facilities, you need smaller scale facilities, you need them to be decentralized and distributed. And I'm working on projects like that in the Himalayas, or have been kind of bring small scale manufacturing there. The question is, I suppose, first of all, do you think that's a market failure? Do you think, do you actually think it's a blind spot or do you think it's a market failure? Do you think that 
you know, sometimes I wonder, having been involved in small scale plastic recycling, is there a viable business model for small scale plastic recycling facilities? Or does, does it actually only become viable when you get to recycling 10 tons a day or 10 tons a week or something? Do you believe, I mean, I, I kind of think there is, but I, I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> um, and I'd like to, do you think it's a blind spot or do you think it's a market failure? And one of the big factors in my experience, and I'd like to have your thoughts on this, please, your experience on this in Nigeria and elsewhere. And one of the big factors in the business model is the cost of energy. And for a lot of the recycling machines, the energy cost, and the cost of the fuel, particularly if you end up having to use diesel gen sets or something, it, it just doesn't make the, the end product viable. So is there a sort of a, a minimum viable <laughs> um, scale or price of energy that you have to take into, into account to be able to kind of say, you know, put the machines to one side, but to be able to say, you know, we need a contract of this size if we're going to have, you know, an energy of this price for it to be able to work. So it's the two questions. Is it a blind spot or is it a market failure? And is there a balance to be found with energy costs? And thank you very much, Andrew. And before, um, before you answer that, I'd just like to bring in one of Felix's questions that I think relates to that, which is the question around um, saying a lot of solutions in the recycling space seem to be solutions looking for problems. So the machines or products that you then look for the market. Um, and I think that relates very much to the, um, the market failure question. So if I could bring that in as well. So Majim, do you want to answer, take those yeah. first? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Andrew and Felix. And uh, Andrew, I think your points are very valid. Uh, from my experience and from what I know is happening in Nigeria and uh, possibly across Africa, it is very, very uh, Sorry, there was some noise there, but uh, uh, like I was saying, there's, there's, there are huge potentials for plastic recycling here in Nigeria. Huge, huge, huge potential. And I, I think the business also depends on which side of the value chain you're talking about. So we, we have people right, right here in, in, in Nigeria that go about collect this plastic waste and then uh, build them or crush them and export them abroad. That's a business model on its own. Uh, for people like us, we get this uh, plastic waste and then we convert it into items of value. Like I said, we, we, we upcycle them into interlocking pavers or interlocking bricks. There is a very, very, very huge market. The only problem is that um, we don't have enough investors playing in, but we're beginning to have them. For instance, last year, there was a company, there's a company in Nigeria called Kaltani that was able to get about $4 million funding for their project. They are into plastic recycling. And I think another, pro another company this year got about uh, 1,000, sorry, a, a million or $2 million investment. So there is actually a very, very huge potential for that in Nigeria and in Africa. And then on the issue of energy, I think it depends on what part of the value chain you're playing at. There are, there are people that can use solar. They can use solar. Nigeria has a lot of sun, and so it's cheaper and makes more sense to use solar for them. But for people like us that require a lot of energy, I think one way around it is by uh, producing our own energy, like I mentioned earlier. So you can basically, through a process called pyrolysis, you can produce your own diesel from plastic wastes. So if we are to go up on a light scale as I want us to, I want us to produce our own diesel from our own plastic. So it saves us cost and it will enable us to also, to also um, uh, run, reduces our operating costs and then it also enable us to, to be able to be independent of getting fuel from outsiders. Thank you. Maybe to, to jump in on the on the last part of energy efficiency, or Anna, do you want to say something before? 
No, um, mm. I think that's a, that's a very good point because also on industrial scale, it's all about energy efficiency versus output or outcome. And especially in all these self-built machines or machines being distributed from Asia, scattered throughout the African continent, that's not the main focus. Um, so if we are developing machines or our machines, we try to use and or to we try to find the sweet spot on costs, what can a machine cost and what components, what industrial components can we scale down to make it as energy efficient as possible. Our injection machine, for instance, needs less electricity than a hair dryer per hour. Um, so, of course, we could make it even more energy efficient, but then, of course, the cost of the machine raises. So, there needs to be the sweet spot found between energy efficiency and what can the market afford on the equipment side. Um, but, and that's one of the things I mentioned before, it's one of these major things why we're not building them locally in, in countries because we just have no access to the, to the tools needed to build. Um, and in the overall lifetime, it's cheaper and better for everybody um, if it's in that way. To talk about the blind spot or market failure, um, I think, or maybe start first with the business model, the viable business model. I think there's definitely there are business models because we have proof of it, not we, we don't do anything, um, but the people using our machines, we have in multiple countries, especially also in Nepal, because you mentioned Nepal, but also in African countries, proof where people are outgrowing the capacity of the machines. They are starting with one and then adding the second, the third, the fourth extruder. The largest recycler Uganda started as a base picking organization, selling, as Vachim told, selling the flakes, getting one extruder from us, producing things, making more money with extruding beams than selling the flakes, having then three, four, five extruders. Um, small scale, not the one large scale, because in the whole infrastructure around, and they need more electricity and so on and so forth if they have larger machines. Um, so there's definitely the possibility of viable business models. Um, and on the blind spot side, our theory, um, and that's the topic I am I'm very excited about usually, I believe that there is no craftsmanship in plastic, working with plastic. It was developed right after industrial revolution. So it's developed straight on industrial level with larger numbers, uh, more automatization and so on. All the other materials, glass, wood, even paper, um, metal, have hundreds or even thousands of years of craftsmanship. So they are very simple tools to work with them up to very automatic high technology tools like you can yeah paper paper was recycled in the old egypt already thousands of years ago um and so in the plastic industry that's so far it was growing so fast the last decades that everybody everybody in the value chain was looking on themselves how can we get better how can we grow but there were no looking left and right maybe you looked of course the one step ahead and the one step back in the value chain but not the whole circle um, which happened in other materials over hundreds of years and i think that's why there's this blind spot because it's not possible to on a small scale to start with simple tools like watch him he would need something very simple but professional to start then he can scale to the next step which is maybe us then there will be the next step if he wants which is then somebody else um, and in all the materials it's possible but in plastic which is the number one material of our century that's not possible because it's either nothing or everything sort of that's such an interesting point um i had never thought about it in those terms but i i see what you mean about the um the sort of the immediate push to to large scale because of when the technology was was developed um andrew you've got your your hand up again oh and and, and felix yeah well just to say that i um, i appreciate those answers thank you very much and i do i do have um uh more more questions uh so perhaps i perhaps i should go next but um but yeah i appreciate those answers very very much and i've i've got a couple of more questions if we have time on it Thanks, Andrew. Okay, Felix, let's come to you, please. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I just like uh, just a few observations and slash questions from my side. Um, uh, we've, I've also worked for about twenty years in in re recycling, partly in the crafts, and now more in the industrial and rest of the daily chain. So, um, I think this on the Andrew's blind spot thing. I think 
and 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 scale the, the what we found always was that in almost any endeavor at a small scale with recycling any material but especially plastic it's really hard to add value um like real value like monetary value or like perceived value especially in our context in africa where the perceived you know, where you know, we call it green guilt you know in europe green guilt is a is a is an easy thing to add value to a product if you're making a craft product or something like or you're making a precious plastic we've had probably about 20 precious plastic startups in south africa and they've all fall, failed eventually because they just couldn't you know when somebody's main utility in a product is to move water from a to b uh a bucket made out of, you know, recycled plastic doesn't add any value and it costs 10 times more because the process is not optimized of scale. And and uh, where in another context it's different. So I think that it's very dangerous to just sort of look, transplant solutions without context. Um, and then also just on the on the value and on, on like the blind spot, you know, we, we were also quite involved in the, Precious plastic side, the, pro the processing of materials into products or crafts or things, and and we eventually also had to stand back and look at the value chain, but not just the value chain of taking a waste material and processing it into something, but like the whole value chain, because the value chain is not just the processing of the material through a facility. And adding value to it, it's you know there's transport and there's other spaces in the value chain that can impact the end result of reducing or moving or, or reprocessing plastic. And then you know where you know in our context we found we had we could make a bigger impact by moving the needle on the collection and the transport of waste into the big facilities than we could actually do by trying to process plastics in any way at the other end of the value chain. So that was just a few sort of observations that from our, our point, from our experience. Um, and then, yeah, just to the point, you know, we've, we've also had even like big Petco is one of the biggest plastic recyclers in South Africa. Um, they produce produce like a plastic wood that they're trying to use for, and it, it's a typical case of uh, a problem, you know, sort of solution looking for a problem. Somebody came up with a material out of waste, and they don't really have an application. They've been looking for an application for twenty years, um, and they at the top end of the of the recycling tree. Um, so yeah, um, there was another question that I wanted to ask, but it's left my brain. I'll ask it later. Thanks. Thanks very much for those those thoughts, Felix. Um, Sir and Wajim, is there anything you'd like to um, reflect on that? Yeah, can, I, can I comment, please? Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Felix, for your observations. And uh, I get where you're coming from. Do I have a different opinion about that? Uh, I tend to agree with, uh, with, with my... Uh, a partner because uh, I I feel there is a large market and then the reason why in Africa I can only talk about what I know in Nigeria for instance there is a huge potential for the plastic recycling business in our own business personally we can't even meet demand that's just the truth there's so much demand for our product we can't even meet demand because we don't have the capacity and there are lots of young entrepreneurs that are willing to dive into this. But I feel personally that the challenge is because of the lack of support, infrastructure in terms of machinery and, and the lack of, of funding. That's why uh, these businesses have not been as possible, as, as, as good as they're supposed to be. I don't know of the situation in South Africa with the precious plastic projects, but for me, from my experience, there's a huge market. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things we, we one of the reasons why we wanted to go into the brick plastic brick production is because Nigeria happens to be the number one or among the top countries 
with the problem of open defecation. Open defecation is just the, the, the lack of access to toilets. So one of the things we really wanted to do was to use the, the, the problem of plastic pollution as a solution to the uh, problem of open defecation. So what we want to do is to, to build eco toilets from plastic. So imagine if we, 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 we have the opportunity to deploy, say, uh, uh, 100 toilets in 100 schools across Nigeria, across Nigeria with plastic. There's going to be a very, very huge market. We're going to use lots of plastic. We're going to create lots of jobs in the process of doing that. And then we're going to make the business sustainable on its own. But the, the problem we have is that nobody seems to be looking at it in the bigger picture. Nobody seems to be thinking outside the box and innovating to see how we can use plastic as a solution to some of the issues we're having. Another thing is the issue of, uh, of, of upcycling, though we don't do it in my company, but I'm aware some other people do it outside Nigeria. You use plastic and you change them into plastic lumber. So you use them as alternatives to wood so you can, you can make furniture out of them. I mean, lots of, of, of schools in Nigeria do not have access to things as basic as school furniture. So some of the students have to sit on the floor to receive their lessons. So what if we have a situation whereby we upcycle some of this plastic and then we turn them into furniture for schools? Because there are basically uh, lots of things we can do with this plastic. But the only thing is that there is no innovation. Nobody is trying to, to look at the bigger picture and then fund some of these big opportunities. I feel if it's done right, plastic waste will be such a very, very big and viable business in Nigeria and I feel in Africa as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Soren, is there anything you'd like to, to add on this? Yes, two things. One from Felix, what he mentioned um, with the, the value which is perceived. Um, the very first ever machine we built were in Uganda. So we were very excited about the first products we made and then realized that nobody cares about the products because it's made in Uganda and it's not good quality if it's made in Uganda and it's even worse if it's made out of waste. Um, so we had to learn in the local context that we need to add different value to the products. We made rulers and made them thicker and stronger and then told the people or showed the people, well, not me, but the local team, that they are more like they they are stronger, they are fitter, and then not mention that they are recycled and made in Uganda, but rather focus on the product versus we have hundreds of other cases, one just to mention in, in the UK, in London, where they're producing hair combs out of waste. They're colorful, unique, handmade. They're selling them for 20 pounds one because only because of the story, because of handmade and recycled waste, which would never ever work, of course, in another context. So that's why it's very, very important to put on the context. And then what Vajim just mentioned with the school furnitures, we have lots of projects, well, lots is maybe too much, but we are, there are dozens of projects where they are producing these things with our machines. But then my question would be, is it really the problem of the material? Like would the schools in Nigeria, like is it just the problem that they have no access to a plastic bench why they cannot afford a school chair? Or is it rather the business model that the school has no money or no infrastructure to buy a bench. And then if the bench is made out of wood or plastic or bricks or whatever, is then another question. And I think that's another thing why we are, we are often hung up on these things like, yeah, there's the need for this and the need for this, but actually that the, the problem is far somewhere else. And then we could think about business models um, and not about materials or the products and how we can actually serve needs on the markets. Um, but that's the whole other dimension to discuss then. Okay, can I uh, respond to your question, Ms. Sorin? Sure, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll be very honest and open. In Africa, and especially in Nigeria, we have governance issues. And what I mean by governance issues is that it's a systemic problem and some things don't work the way they're supposed to or work like they do in other countries. It is just what it is, unfortunately. So that's our reality. And that, that's even the more reason why we need support for entrepreneurship, because there, there are lots of young people that are driven by passion, people like me, do you understand? 
who are driven purely by passion for sustainability and what we feel we can do for the environment. But unfortunately, when a young person is really passionate about helping to solve a problem, but there is no support, do you understand, in terms of government support or from other avenues, the person just, the dream just dies off. And then maybe the person looks for another opportunity to maybe get a job somewhere or then get something doing. Uh, the reason why we are still where we are is just because of the passion we have, because the business environment is really not encouraging. And I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it as it is without trying to mince words. And that's why we need to have um, another alternative besides governments. That's why we need to have things like um, uh, uh, plastic credits. I think there's a big room for things like plastic credits so that if uh, there's a way people can generate plastic credits and then they have access to funds, it can be an alternative way of funding small businesses like ours. And also there's a need for investment from other people from abroad that are passionate about uh, plastic waste as well. And there's a need to, to, to interface with people like us. Now you have to be careful. I'll be very honest about that because it's not everybody in Africa or in Nigeria that claims to be who they are. We may have one or two people that may want to scam people or things like that. So there's a need for people to be careful also. And that's why it's good to go through uh, associations like the Recyclers Association of Nigeria and then to also come up with... Um, Programs. I mean, you can you can have like uh, an accelerator program or uh, an incubator program program based on just plastic waste. So I mean, there are lots of ways to go about these things, whereby you can save uh, the, the serious people from those that are not serious. But unfortunately, nobody just pays attention to that, and that's one of the problems that we are having. So I feel the issue of plastic credits could really really go a long way. And then we also need to come up with innovative ways of, of providing uh, support for plastic entrepreneurs because they are the only people that will help to solve the problem of plastic waste in Africa. Thank you so much. There are some, some very interesting suggestions in there. Um, Andrew, you've had your hand up for a while. Let me come back to you now. Thanks, and thank you for that discussion. Um, one of the visions that I've had in my small scale plastic recycling work is that um, hardware stores, places that sell uh, shelter products, and I, you know, one of, the, one of my conclusions of my work in um, small scale distributed plastic recycling is that shelter products is the way to go. Um, and I think you, it's, we've seen similar examples here today. Um, hardware stores could have machines on site that could produce products, um, you know, inside the hardware stores essentially to go onto the shelves. Or at least there would be a deal made between hardware stores, hardware store chains, and plastic waste producers to, to produce and then put the products on the shelves. Have you seen anything like that from hardware stores? Should we be approaching this business opportunity from the demand side in that way, from hardware stores working backwards. And then my second question is, um, well, I, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to tell you my opinion and then, uh, and then see if you, if you can second this or not. I'm not at all convinced that recycling plastic to make 3D printer filament is ever commercially worthwhile. What do you think? <laughs> Let's start with the second one because it's easy. I think the same um, and we see the same. Um, and we have every day, I guess, a dust of requests if our machines can do that and if it works and we tell no and well, it works on the technical side, but on the commercial business model side, then it's, a, it's a the other question. Um, and, and there are places in the world where there are very good reasons to do that because the supply of 3D printer filament is painful. Yes. But actually, commercially, is it does it make sense? Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. But, but but I think why that, that that's such a huge topic and it still is for many years now because it's the only thing we as a world know about working with plastic mm -hmm. on a small scale is 3D printing. 
Um, so when we talk about the craftsmanship again, 3D printing is the closest we come towards working with plastic or with this material. Although it's a different way working with a material than it would be if we really do injection molding, extrusion molding, and so on and so forth. Um, and to go from there, maybe to the to the other question, the hardware store question, oh, or topic. Um, the very for us exciting thing, which could be a good business model, talking about business models today, would be that in many regions in the world, in the global south, um, we're talking about infrastructural islands. So not islands like on the ocean and islands, but it's the same. Like Arua is so far away from Osaka that the transportation in between is so costly that they are islands not connected to each other, although it's only two, three, four hours away from each other. Um, and that's why we know in all these regions, so all five to 10 kilometers, you have the same stores. You have the same, like you all know it when you travel around or, or walk around. And that could be the same with all these plastic things, exactly. Um, we just started a project in Greenland, in Eastern Greenland. Um, it's a very, very isolated area with 3,000 people living there and only these people speaking the language. Um, and of course, there's a hardware store. Um, and they need to ship everything there. Nothing grows there, nothing is there. And only three months a year you can bring things there and then they're isolated because of ice. Um, so we are very excited to really start this project there, especially with the local hardware store, um, to then prove the concept, to then be able to show to others as well. Um, and we have, yeah, so far, it's a it's a, a hypothesis from us that it works, but so far we haven't found a partner who really tried to do it with us. So in Greenland, we found for us a perfect match um, to actually try and do it now. Um, on the other side, on the impact side, so we, for us, the focus was always more the people than the environment, because we said, well, there's so much plastic waste, our small machines have a limited uh, benefit or impact on the environment but on people's lives, we can maybe have a, a, an impact. And so we came up with the concept of the, we call it plastic library to say, you have a machine somewhere, you have the molds or the, the tools, and then somebody who cannot even afford a product or a school who cannot afford a school bench can go collect the waste, can go to the library, get the mold there and then produce it by themselves and then take it home. So basically they have their own labor brought in, bring their own plastic waste. It's like a makerspace sort of thing, you know? You have the tools, you have the equipment, um, you get taught once how it works, and then you come with your own stuff. And then you have suddenly, you could have an impact on people's lives with the products they could need or would need. Um, on the other side, by itself, maybe business models start or new ideas come up and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there are a lot of different angles how you can can turn and twist um, these ideas. I think that's um, a really important point. Um, the um, the sharing of of molds and and access to equipment is is obviously something that helps to lower the initial cost and the possibility for some organisations to use their own labour mm -hmm. um, in situations where it can be done, you know, with unskilled labour makes a lot of sense um yeah i think those are some some great Maybe ideas to say one more sentence to it because mm -hmm. uh i think felix was mentioning christmas plastic a couple of times um i think what we have seen what is a, a large struggle is that through precious plastic is open source platform probably everybody knows here who is here today um there is this and that's also where we worked with a lot back in 2015 when it all started we were very actively involved in the beginning of precious plastic and we we're the first people in the african continent to build actually something after the blueprints and so on but evolved a lot from there because the main issue was that we have now all these great ideas and there are all these these different concepts you can twist and turn into but at the end you the last thing you want to worry about are the technical side they need to work always and out our experience, that was the main issue which didn't work. Like some of the same things breaking down, things having uh, explosions, people getting injured. So that's why I always say we don't need to focus on the technical side. Engineers can take care of that and that's all there. But we all need to focus on the how to implement it, how to bring the stakeholders together, how to make the funding maybe available, how to make the business model or the concepts available, but not the technical side. 
And then a lot of us have tried it with these blueprints and open source, and then it failed because of the technical side. And then they think, well, small scale doesn't work. It's not possible. Um, but if you have built up like we a distribution network with supply chains, with spare parts, with machine functioning, we shipped them to Somalia, never step a foot there, and they're running for two years now with people getting employed and so on. I think that's also a very crucial play that we don't want to worry about the technical side because that's not rocket science, but rather on the rocket science, which would be the implementation of it. I'm really glad to hear you say that. Um, some years ago, I, I worked with an organization that was um, looking at, um, I won't go into too many details, but a particular type of, of plastics recycling. Um, and essentially they were trying to develop the business model alongside the technology to do it. And you can't do that because you can't test a business model if you haven't got you know, properly industrialized technology that's reliably working. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, there's a comment uh, from Andrew in the chat about a shout out to Saeed on this call, who's done a lot of the work in Bangladesh. Um, and so I just wanted to invite Saeed if there's anything that you'd like to, to share from your work. Um, I don't know how your connection is, but if you would like to, we would love to hear from you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so thank you, Andrew, and and uh, uh, I was basically working on uh, the shelter products in Bangladesh in the uh, Cox's Bazar refugee camp. We actually tried to build some recycled uh, plastic products like float tiles, roof tiles, and bricks. So the uh, discussion was uh, so much relatable to my experience and. Uh, journey uh, for last two years uh, with the plastic recycling and uh, what I actually learned I pretty much agree with Andrew uh, with the plastic recycling facilities the costing of the machinery is pretty high uh, like uh, I'm, if I talk about the global south uh, we are uh, still uh, facing some difficulties with the machineries and also with the spare parts so uh, once uh, uh, someone can actually uh, afford to get a machine, but it's pretty difficult to arrange the spare parts. And also one thing that I actually learned from uh, uh, the uh, uh, projects I did uh, was uh, the amount of plastic, plastics we are dealing. If we try to make uh, a consume bulk amount of plastic with uh, uh, large products, the uh, molding cost or the, the, the uh, other related cost or investment is pretty high and it's pretty difficult to deal with those things. And now I'm currently uh, working with another project uh, that is also related to the plastic recycling. And we are basically focusing on the uh, on a sustainable uh, business model. And we are currently working with the Cox's Bazaar municipalities um, that are focusing on uh, using their uh, uh, land and uh, providing some machineries and technical support to the local uh, SME entrepreneurs uh, so that they can actually use the machines and uh, the technical uh, team will actually support them developing their products. Once the product gets a, uh, can generate a good market value, they will uh, then uh, do the investment in their uh, own uh, land and also they will uh, this uh, that that basically uh, uh, focusing on uh, su uh, supporting the local uh, SMEs uh, with the uh, machines and technical uh, knowledge and design supports, so that they can actually test out the uh, any minimal viable product, and then they can scale uh, up on those products. So uh, yeah, so far this is the current status in uh, in Bangladesh. What we are working on. And the uh, and different uh, thing is uh, what we uh, pay, uh, we uh, we uh, faced some uh, being uh, found difficult was uh, um, the plastic blends because uh, the uh, how the way we are actually dumping the waste uh, these actually need some behavioral change so we are actually designing some behavioral nudges to you know, uh, so that we can easily uh, separate the plastic waste and uh, mostly focusing on the hard to recycle plastics. 
and so only the business model is not actually the main uh, difficulties also there need to be some uh, uh, option to do some behavioral uh, changes so that uh, the uh, supply chain is uh, more sorted and that might uh, make the uh, entire value chain uh, easy and also might uh, reduce some costing in terms of production. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Syed, for, for sharing some of your experience with us and uh, your comments there about um, the, uh, you know, the defining the business first, um, I think echo some of um, what we've heard from other people. And also there's a comment from Felix in the chat to that effect saying the business side and the product client problem need to come first. I think that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's very clear. Um, I, if there are other people, um, in the audience who have experience to share um, questions, please do feel free to, to come forward to either um, put your hand up or, or talk in the chat or whatever. Um, I would also like to just see if, if Sarah or Wajim would like to comment at all on, on what Syed has just shared. I think since it's also like a group of makerspaces or makerspace interested people here, I think that especially what Syed just said about creating the minimum viable product could be, or maybe even should be a role of makerspaces to have the possibilities to go produce your first idea and you don't need to recycle plastic. You can 3D print it or cut it out of paper or whatever, go out and test it, then 3D print it, 3D print it 10 times, 20 times, 50 times. Then you can 3D print a mold for injecting recycled plastic very fast, very cheaply. You have lots of iteration possibilities so with very low costs you can make injection molding possible with 3d printed molds once you have the first 100 200 300 pieces sold tested on the market then you can maybe think well can we invest now or should we invest in a real mold or recycling process and i think as startups and probably lots of most of the people working with them we also need to know that every enterprise trying to develop new products on the markets have large teams, a lot of money. And then I just know from Philips where we had a, a workshop once, I think one product out of, I don't know how many hundreds of ideas they're testing is really entering the market then. And in a similar approach, we also need to go around these business models and these ideas and minimum viable products to have the access to test hundreds of products um, on the markets and then the entrepreneurial spirit comes into the mind and not how does the injection machine looks like and does it work yeah yeah that that's an important point um Wajim you've obviously got a very successful product in your interlocking pavers and I'm just wondering was that the first product you came up with or did you have to do a lot of of market testing and you know how did you develop that uh okay uh interlocking pivots web were the first products we developed uh, and it was purely out of passion. And then we, we, we saw that there was potential for that. We actually uh, came across the technology on YouTube and uh, we were able to practice and then we got better as time went on. It took us about two, three years before we got commercial, but we were able to get it to a point whereby it was a minimum viable product and uh, it was aesthetically pleasing enough and strong enough. And uh, we were lucky to have been uh, featured in a BBC video and it gave us uh, a lot of publicity and mm. we started getting uh, lots of requests and were able to do some projects. So uh, from my own experience, I actually feel there's, 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 there's a very big market for plastic waste recycling as a business in Nigeria and in Africa because, uh, well, things in Nigeria are quite similar across other countries in Africa as well. But um, there is a huge gap in terms of uh, training, in terms of support, in terms of funding, in terms of infrastructural development. For instance, uh, we'll need to have our machines produced within our country. So that's why we need people like Soren coming in to, to, to help 
train and maybe if possible set up some of their factories here in Africa so they can use within the country and we don't need to, for instance, if our parts get broken down, we don't need to import our parts from abroad. Though I know as a business it may be difficult for them, but I feel this is the kind of conversations we should be having. And I also feel uh, the whole thing about plastic recycling issue of encouragement of using plastic to build long lasting things. I don't see a point whereby you take you recycle plastic into another pet bottle or you recycle plastic into something that will not last long. At the end of the day, we're not helping to solve the problem. But if we can use plastic and turn it into one of two things, either an infrastructure that you use for building, like I said, with regards to, to, to building eco toilets that are going to last for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I think that's the best way of solving the problem of plastic instead of just using it for things that will not last long. So we're not really helping to solve the problem. So I feel uh, entrepreneurs need to go back to the drawing board and then need to come up with innovative solutions that are going to help to tackle the problem. We don't like entrepreneurs in Africa. We just lack an enabling environment. And I also want to say that uh, there's a need for us to have conversations around uh, plastic credits. I feel it's really go a long way in support of companies. For instance, I'm, if my company is able I'm, to... Sorry. sorry, I was struggling to hear you for a moment then, but I think the connections just got slightly better. Do you want to just try again, Majim? Okay, so I was just uh, trying to say that we need to have more conversations about plastic credits and how we can make a reality for entrepreneurs to benefit from it because I feel it provides a huge opportunity and opens up lots of vistas for entrepreneurs to, to benefit from uh, the funding it brings to scale up and then to also uh, expand their businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of comments in, in the chat. Um, Andrew, are you um, available at the moment? It's, I think you made a comment about how long it's taken Polyfloss to get their machine um, ready and, and Siren is asking why. I think that's an interesting discussion. Sure, if you could the, perhaps um, just give us a bit of background about that. Please. The Polyfloss machine, I actually happen to have the picture of the latest version available on my phone. The Polyfloss machine, um, started as a candy floss machine. A candy floss machine that you put little pellets of uh, plastic in instead of sugar. Uh, in America, they might call it cotton candy. Um, in Australia, I think they call it fairy floss. But instead of putting sugar in, you put plastic in. And um, I mean, it was sort of a vertical tube with a spinning head and what they basically found was um, the spinning head which was the core of the invention uh, to, to make a sort of floss like substance that emerges it's um, looks a little bit like insulation or um, looks a little yeah it looks like candy floss clouds of plastic filament um, what they found was that the spinning head was the barrier to, to speed because you had to physically push plastic through the spinning head and you had to get it at the right temperature and all of this. So what they've switched to is an extruder arrangement um, and then a blower and an extruder arrangement and it's increased throughput by a factor of 10, which means you can make 10 times as much money <laughs> with it, essentially, uh, with the same machine. But the machine is now more expensive. Um, it's, it's taken, you know, they invented it, a team... Uh, invented it as a student project, uh, you know, well, 10, 12 years ago. And it's been a, a labor of love since then. And I've, I've been able to bring some investment to develop this technology. And the reason why I've been able to bring this investment is because um, I've been looking at it for insulation, for making insulation for shelters, for houses. But then also because it's a floss, you can form it without having high pressure tools. Um, so you can lay it out in a mold and then put, push the molds together so to make rulers or um, lampshades or whatever you might want to make with it. Um, so it's a different kind of 
plastic recycling machine. The 10 years was basically um, quite a bit of trial and error to improve the throughput, to improve the reliability of the machine, crucially to make it safe. And the, the heated elements, the electrical elements, the spinning elements, um, and, the, and the safety features are expensive, but they are, you know, um, we've had too many accidents with too many improvised <laughs> uh, small scale plastic recycling machines, I think. And, this, and they want to be a commercial company, so they need to be able to get these safety certifications. Uh, and it's taken a long time. But I think it is getting to a point where, you know, they're at trade shows now. Uh, they, you know, they they travel to they're going to ADEX next week, which is an aid sector trade show, and they have a big stall and they show off what they do and they're making sales and you know it, it's making progress. So it's a, it's another machine um, which occasionally you might find in one or two maker spaces around the world as well. Be interested just... in your reflections on that, sir, and, and in particular about the, the journey to make machines. No, it's, it's perfect because we have reliable. followed them very closely for many years because we love what they're doing. But that's a little bit also what I mentioned before at, at one point to say there's so many ideas working isolated or in the wrong sector with the solutions. Because again, on an industrial level, that exists probably. Um, for I don't know how many decades already um, but then it needs the right people the right mindset to bring it or to scale it down and then the right partners who know how to do it because it's their daily business with hundreds of employees and then to connect them and then to bring it down and I think I have been in so many calls with UN organizations about waste management in refugee camps and I don't know what they tell well we have so many and so much I say well in this call of 20 people and we have the fourth round of the call there's no single person who is doing this on a industrial business level it's all ngos and stakeholders and partners but not the one like there's this big gap between the people dealing in plastic sector and dealing with the actual waste and recycling and virgin plastic and whatsoever and then there are all the others who are saying we want to solve the issue the problem in the world um and I think a next big step for all of us would be to connect closer and at ADEX not only go there to be in the um, now let's say the, the NGO sector or the yeah the aid sector but to also try to bring these plastic recycling people and their thousands of employees these companies to bring there and say see that's the issues we are facing and now I want a solution and we have these and these and these projects for working on machines for working on business models um, and I think that's what's happening slowly, but what is a, has a huge potential to combine these worlds. Um, and there must be a common ground for both sides, of course, to, to work together and to be interested in working with each other. Um, but then I think it would be on the technical side easier um, to scale products. And on the other side, we, as the people who are more involved on the practical local side, can focus more on implementing the things, but not trying to, yeah, develop things. Their company has hundreds of patents probably on it. Yeah, yeah. and I think that um, part of that also goes back to what Bajim was saying earlier in the call about, you know, the need to make sure that the the big producers of plastic are involved in the conversation, and um, you know that we're talking to the right people at the right scale um i think there's yeah there's clearly a big need to um be strategic about who's involved in these conversations and the the impact that they can have um and uh, i see a comment in the chat from andrew that he can feel a horizon europe project idea coming on and i yes would i would agree with that um, i think there's there's a lot of scope there um I think we're we're coming to the end of our time. Um, we're about to wrap up. I just want to ask if there are any closing thoughts um, from uh, either of our featured speakers, Sir and Wajim, if you'd like to just add anything final. Um, or... Okay, uh, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you everybody for, for participating. I think uh, we need to have more of these conversations. We need to bring, um, uh, 
people that are passionate about this plastic waste together. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll move this forward. It shouldn't end here, but we should sort of create an avenue whereby uh, potential investors can meet and, and discuss the entrepreneurs, the potential investors, the machine makers like uh, Soren and uh, other stakeholders need to come together. Even uh, the, the big companies, multinational companies that, that, that produce some of these plastic things as part of their extended producer responsibility, we need to have a conversation on how to, 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 to make this thing more organized, organize ourselves and see how um, we can come together to solve the problem of plastic waste. I strongly believe that it is a problem that can be solved, but we need to go back to the drawing board, think uh, very well about this and then innovate and come up with solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Majim. Um, yes, I, I really agree that um, we need to, to find ways to keep this conversation going and um, yeah, and bring it to the right people. Um, any final words from your side, Soren? No, okay. In that case, I will just um, thank you both very much, Wajim and Surin, for agreeing to be the featured speakers on this call. Um, thank you so much to others who have shared their own experiences and thoughts and asked questions. And thank you to all of you for taking part. Um, this uh, recording will be made available on, on YouTube and we'll share the link when that's uploaded. So thank you all very much indeed. We'll leave it there. Have a good day. Thank you.